Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar today about how to make money from mobile gaming. As you can see, I'm here with Phil Todd, Director of Stereoscope and author of the Smartphone Gaming 2021 report. Uh, Phil is about to introduce our, our panel of speakers today to dig into this topic. So Phil, I'll hand over to you and uh, we'll be listening. Thank you very much, Mitch. So yes, welcome everybody. Um, today I'm going to be giving a bit of a high level canter through some of the top line findings from the smartphone gaming report which is a new report uh, just about to be published by MF um, but I'm joined today by three um, panelists who are going to look at how that um, consumer demand can be monetized um, and uh, looking at therefore from the advertising perspective um, I'm going to let them each introduce themselves first of all I'm joined by Jean Salterin Jean would you like to just say a few words Hello, nice, uh, a pleasure to be with you all. And uh, indeed, I well, I'm a uh, regional director for Game Loft in Latin America, handling between Mexico and Brazil, and uh, overseeing all the um, all the business activity we have with brands and uh, media agencies. Thank you, John. Um, we're also joined by Joanne Lacey. Joanne, would you like to say a few words as well? Hi there, uh, good afternoon. Um, it's great to be back on MF webinar. Um, um, my name's Joanne. Um, I'm the COO at Adimo. Um, Adimo is a in-game uh, advertising platform. So we're a monetization platform uh, for developers uh, and we work with advertisers uh, to deliver immersive in-game advertising campaigns. Thank you, Joanne. It sounds fascinating. I'm sure we'll come on to more of that in a moment. Um, we're also joined by Bernardo Mendez. Bernardo, would you like to just uh, introduce yourself as well? Sure. Hi, guys. I'm Bernardo. I'm Chief Gaming Officer at Great, uh, a creative agency that connects uh, gamers and brands here in Brazil. That's great. Thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, kick off today uh, by uh, running through some of the headlines from uh, our uh, recent report. Let me just see if I can share my screen. So today I'm going to talk through the, the top line findings of the Smartphone Gaming 2021 report, um, as you can see on the, on the slide now. Um, and this really uh, was drawn out of a survey that MEF did earlier in the year um, to try and understand sort of the, the, the scale and range of smartphone game playing, um, how often people play games, what are the issues there. So there are four main goals, as you can see on this slide. It's really looking at that uh, profile of game playing, understanding what is holding people back from doing game players, doing more on their smartphone, um, looking at the profiles of, of frequent game players and the casual game, sort of at either extreme of game playing. But then lastly, also looking at um, Profiles of two specific countries. Well, so we look at 10 countries overall, but we also look at a slightly deeper dive at Brazil and Japan in the report, who are at either ends of, of the extremes of game playing as well when you look at people um, in, in country there. So the, the survey overall, um, it covered 10 countries, as I just mentioned, 650 respondents per country, so quite granular in, in detail. Um, those sam that sample segmented by age, by gender, by mobile platform, harbor manufacturer, and a whole range of other um, metrics in there that, that you will see in the data if, if, you, if you go down that road and look at it. Um, and we've also got some interesting views on, um, for instance, high and low mobile engagement and how that plays out with uh, game players as well. So the first main slide I want to look at here is just the general market landscape, game playing. How many people play games on the smartphone? Have they ever played a game? Uh, looked at by the different countries here. And while the global average at the bottom of the screen here, 68% uh, of mobile users have played a game uh, at some point, um, we can see that Brazil and South Africa are actually slightly ahead of, the, ahead of that global figure, at 76 and 75%. Um, of people who have ever played a, a game on, on their phone. And at the other end of the scale, down at the UK, perhaps slightly surprising, 61% um, have, have played games. Um, so there, there's a range of country uh, gaming penetrations that we can see here at that high sort of level. 
if we start to drill in and start to look at those who do play games, um, look at those players who have played a game at least once per month, we can start to see that, uh, that we get some more differentiation. Um, we start to see that Japan and South Africa um, and France are leading the pack in terms of countries where there are the most number of um, people who play a game at least once a month on their phone, down to Brazil at 42%, which is, and we'll start to see this interesting as we go through this, where um, there's some interesting dynamics around um, game playing in Brazil in particular. Uh, it shows a very different profile from other countries. Uh, only 42% are, are game playing every month. Um, so there's, there's some interesting dynamics going on there that, that the report drills into. If we look at um, the sort of hardware that, that players are using, we can see here that the, this is for people who, again, play their games at least once per month. Um, Sony handset users, 92% are playing once a month, right down to the other end of the scale, uh, LG and Motorola, where much lower proportion of people with those handsets are playing games every month, 71% with LG and 59% with Motorola. So there's something interesting there. Of course, it's gonna be affected uh, overall by uh, the, the, the penetration of handsets, particularly if we start to look at this by, by country as well. There are other factors in play there, but I think it's quite interesting just to see uh, how, how handset starts to affect the, the um, frequency of playing games. And if the other thing that I think the report looked at, which was quite interesting, is um, game playing isn't isn't in isolation. It's competing for eyeballs uh, with other activities as well. And here we looked at game playing in the context of those people who also listen to music, and people who also watch video clips, video content, whether it's um, clips or TV or films or other sorts of video content. And what we find here is that. Gaming absolutely competes with music as the most popular smartphone activity. Um, so the, here on this slide, we're looking at, have you done any of these activities in the last six months? Um, and through that lens, you can see there that playing a game, generally it's the most popular activity just ahead of listening to music and video tends to be um, further down, down the heap uh, in terms of uh, frequency of doing. Which I think it's quite interesting because if you think, Game playing is quite a lean forward activity. Listening to music is a bit of more of a lean back activity. So there's some interesting um, dynamics into how uh, individuals are engaging with that type of activity. Now, in here, we can also see there's some interesting difference in terms of the uh, type of country profile. And in particular, I draw your attention to countries such as Japan, which, um, whereas in other countries, listening to music is only a little bit behind uh, playing a game. In Japan, playing games is, is a lot more popular than the other sorts of activity, which is quite interesting as well, I think. So we're starting to see, as we go through this, some uh, differences in, in what the populations in different countries are, are doing in terms of game playing compared to other activities as well. Now, if we start to look at that by um, people who play games a bit more often, once a month, here now we start to see that actually listening to music is slightly more popular than monthly game playing. Again, we can start to see Brazil being very different from other countries here, uh, being the second cluster of bars going in, in a much lower portion of everything, whether it's game playing, whether it's listening to music or watching video on your, on your smartphone, that level of activity is much lower. So I think it shows it's a, there's some other interesting dynamics going on within the market there that's pushing down that frequency of, of activity. The report, as I mentioned at the start, also looked at uh, what is it that's holding game players back from using their phone for more things. Now, the way the questions were asked, it's for doing anything, but uh, the audience here is just, it's just been sliced for um, game players. Um, and what we can see here is that uh, across all these different countries, in quite a lot of these countries, the, 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 the biggest response is that users don't need to use their phones more for more mobile apps or more services. These are the bar, the vertical uh, bars in blue, columns in blue. Um, so there's a, there's a case here that says, well, actually, they're not being enticed to use their phone more for different sorts of things, let alone gaming. So there, there's a, uh, maybe a, an, an argument here for more innovation that will drive more usage. 
uh, because we're not users aren't seeing things and saying, "Oh, I'd really like to do that more." Now, the in in here, the interesting country again, I would suggest, is Japan in the middle of the the list of countries there, where the orange bar, the highest orange bar there, I don't limit my my mobile use at all. Um, they're doing everything that they want to do. Uh, there's no limits whatsoever. So I think that's quite interesting. And, and as we'll see with Japan, there's very high usage of mobile gaming because people feel they're unfettered in, in what they're doing with, with their phones anyway. We also then in the report um, looked at uh, a little bit more detail at the high frequency gamer and the casual gamer. So here we're looking at high frequency gameplay. Now, for the purposes of the report, we define this as being people who play games at least once per day, at least once every day. Um, and we see here that on, on average, the total number of, I looked at the total audience overall, 59% um, of our users uh, play a game at least once a day. Um, so they are high frequency gamers, almost 60% really. But when you look at it by country, there's quite a lot of variation. And in Japan, over three quarters of game players uh, are playing a game at least once a day. Um, and this goes down as we expect Brazil to bring up the tail end at just 21% being high frequency gamers. And there's a spread across the middle here, um, say from Japan at 76% down to India at 56%. So there's a, but overall, there's a reasonable penetration of high frequency gaming across all these countries. And for those high frequency gamers, if we look at what hardware they're using, what, what brand of phone they're using, 76% um, of Sony handset users are high frequency gamers. Um, Huawei down at 64%, Apple 61%, and generally the Android handsets are in the sort of the 55 to 60% turf in the middle of the chart there. Um, and at the tail end, high frequency gamers, you don't find so many of them on LG or Motorola handsets. At the other end of the scale of get playing games, the casual user, and we've defined this for the purposes of the reporters, people who play only, only play games once every six months or so, that, that sort of frequency. Um, globally, only 10% of users uh, see themselves as casual gamers. Um, they're, they're generally they're people playing a lot more games than that. Um, but in Brazil, that's up at 37% who are casual gamers, which I think is quite interesting, but it ties in with the other views of that country as we saw earlier in terms of the number of people who are playing who are high frequency gamers and so on. Um, and this was really one of the reasons why we picked Brazil as a country to do a bit of a deep dive in the main report as well. Looking across the other countries here as well, India, Germany, UK, China, uh, and so on, they're down generally down in the single figures of uh, the proportion of, of users in those countries who are casual gamers. So the general impression being that if you play games, you tend to play games more than once for six months or not at all. Um, the the mid-ground being, you know, every month or so uh, when you're playing games is the sort of sweet spot, I think. And again, we can look at this by hardware. Um, so 27% of, of uh, respondents with Motorola hardware are casual gamers. Um, so this is in a way is the reverse of the slide we saw with hardware by high frequency gaming. So Sony, uh, just 6% of Sony hardware owners are casual gamers where we saw it much higher um, for more frequent gamers or high frequency gamers. And the last couple of slides really I want to talk about today. Um, we looked in more detail, as I said, at Brazil. Um, so here we can see that uh, uh, Brazil compared to the global figures, the global figures are in, in yet that yellow orange uh, by frequency of playing games. So the casual gamer, once every six months or less, down at the bottom there, 10% in Brazil, 37% of global, global uh, sample are uh, casual uh, casual gamers. Um, Whereas up at the uh, frequency of uh, high frequency playing games, 
Um, globally, 59% of, of our sample are high frequency gamers. Uh, in Brazil, it's just 21%. So in a way, it's the, sort of the, 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 the reverse of that frequency of game playing curve when you look at Brazil against the global figures. Again, if we look at the same data for Japan, um, we can see Japan is actually a slightly more extreme version of the global data. Global data, again, in that orange yellow figure. Uh, frequent gamers, 59% globally, 76% in Japan. So over three quarters of, of Japanese gamers are high frequency gamers. Um, but as we go down in terms of frequency, we can see that very few gamers in Japan are uh, playing it uh, on, a, on a casual basis every six months or less. Um, so there's an interesting country profiles um, that we can look at there. And the report goes into a bit more detail looking at it um, by those two countries. So finally, the, the full report is going to be available, I believe, next week. Um, as usual, that with all the data that people can take on board and look at it by country, by sector, by enterprise size, and all the other splits that are available, available within the data. And I would encourage anybody who's interested in, in digging into this a little bit more to have a look um, at all the data that, that is available there. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing the slides um, and come back to our, our panelists. Um, and let me ask, uh, kick off the discussion really today with, with a couple of questions. Um, so perhaps I can start off with, with, with John. Um, thinking about the, um, the, the sheer depth of game playing that's going on out in, out in the market there from consumers, um, what, did, what do developers need to keep in mind from an advertising point of view so that we don't um, slow down this, this game playing that, that we see out there in the market? Because obviously game players might find adverts as a little intrusive, or is it, or do they see it as this is part, part of the deal these days anyway, they're expecting gaming. What, what's your view? Well, uh, I believe that gamers are um, used to interact with advertising within the games. It became really a part of the gameplay. It's normal as a vast majority of the, um, of the industry moved to the free-to-play. So first, mm -hmm. when we started a long time ago, 20 years ago, uh, mm -hmm. the games were basically premium. We were purchasing a game, downloading it, playing it on your, on your platform. Then we evolved into a more free-to-play focus. So you download the game from free from the, from the store. And then within the game, if you have a high engagement and you want to, to uh, move faster and progress faster, then you will get into paying something. And we had uh, in the past few years, a huge amount of games uh, that are hyper casual. So without any purchase within it, it's one mm -hmm. finger gameplay, highly casual games. So it's, uh, it's a bit as well to focus on a huge amount of users that don't want to spend a lot of time, don't want to spend money in the games. So uh, there is a, this, um, this big segment of uh, mobile gaming, which is casual gaming, which is one finger and which is monetized only with advertising. So we have different um, different point of view in, in that. I think if, if we can bring some advice uh, to the people that are developing free to play games, first is to think about how you can integrate the advertising without breaking the uh, end user experience, which is mm -hmm. basically the basic concern that any game developer should have like keep the users engaged, don't offer them too many options to leave the experience <laughs> if they like it. But so you need to cleverly find a, basically the point cut, what we call the point cut, a moment where the user and the gamer will not be playing actively. So jumping from one option to another one, one level to another one. Mm -hmm. And so re really cleverly uh, spot the point where you can Put some advertising. Uh, always think about as well putting some uh, slots for rewarding advertising because as it became really something natural for gamers to be interacting with advertising within the games, uh, sometimes the user goes and look for advertising. So basically watch a video to unlock this item because it's a way to enrich and to reward the experience of the user. So it's not disturbing the, uh, the activity, it's helping basically the users. So in mm -hmm. that case, the advertising is perceived in a positive way and the brand is helping the gamer into his experience. So it's not mm -hmm. the way around when the brand or 
in that case, the game developer is uh, stopping and frustrating the user. It's more providing some additional elements thanks to the advertising. Which certainly seems to be given the the prevalence of uh, high frequency gaming that um, the, the game developers have got this right and that they are they're sort of finding a way to get people to play frequently, uh, even if it's a casual one finger game, they're certainly doing it more and more and more, especially in countries like Japan. Um, but in terms of sort of getting advertising, let, let me bring Joanne in, into the conversation here as well. Um, now, for people aren't familiar with this sort of programmatic advertising, can you perhaps you give a little bit of, of idea of how, the, how this works and, and how it works in a, in a gaming environment as well? Sure. So um, I think Jean hit the nail on the head that this is all about the end user experience and, and not breaking uh, the end user experience. So um, the uh, Adamo uh, serves in-game advertising. Um, so um, the ads are served directly, programmatically um, into gameplay. Um, so that means um, from a, a player point of view, um, there's absolutely no interruption um, because it's part of the actual game design. Um, right. Um, so the obvious examples would be uh, billboards in a racing game or in a mm -hmm. sports game, um, but also you know in in an urban uh, scene setting um, where you would see um, uh, outdoor advertising uh, traditionally. Um, but the programmatic element is the. Um, is we work with developers, so they download uh, our SDK um, and they make the, the decision about where to place the ad, but they're not mm -hmm. physically placing the ad. The, the actual campaign is served programmatically, so that changes, mm -hmm. all, uh, changes all the time. Um, but the, the, the game developers are, are picking um, either high frequency um, areas in the game because that would monetize better. So that could be menus um, or um, customization screens. Um, but it really has to be about where it authentically would sit in the game. Um, mm -hmm. Because the, the key things here, um, uh, which uh, Jean was talking about in terms of not breaking the end user experience, is, is retaining player immersion. Uh, and trying to find that balance between monetization and retention. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because um, you know, ads in games is not new, um, and that there's a complete acceptance by uh, uh, consumers, as you see from uh, your report, um, because they're getting a value. They get to play great yeah. games yeah. Uh, for free. Um, but there are lots of mobile games out there. Um, mm. So the risk to developers in terms of churn um, is, is significant. So, so, so um, finding monetization models um, that balance um, uh, making revenue for the developers, but, retake, but uh, keeping the player experience um, uh, front of mind uh, and minimizing churn is, is, is really what the ad monetization teams and developers um, um, are, are focused on every day. Is that what you see as the, the biggest challenges in the sense is trying to find either existing or, or new ways of, of monetizing the apps with adverts, but that doesn't break the, break the, the, the process, break it from, from the gamer's point of view. It's almost subliminal almost, I guess. Yeah, I mean, subliminal is also not good. So that's not good for the brand advertiser. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's it's about creating authentic experiences, uh, right. and actually, uh, and I'm sure Jean uh, can can, uh, can speak to this as well. Um, it the ads can add value to the player. The player expects to see adverts there. Mm -hmm. um, it might, but but um, we ran a survey recently um, with um, Pocket Gamer, which is a, a, in, a mobile game developer industry uh, publication. Um, and we found that um, game developers, um, they want to be able to control the ads that are shown in game. I think it was like 52%, so over 50% wanted to have that control. So yes, mm -hmm. they want to be able to monetize um, through uh, as many ads as possible, but actually they don't necessarily want a certain brand category in their game because maybe the creative doesn't fit the art style um, or they just don't want to be associated with that brand. And, and, and that's the challenge and, and that's mm -hmm. why um, yeah, John and, and brand partnerships uh, work so well because it's it, it's 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 really integrated into the game. Mm -hmm. 
let me bring Bernardo to the conversation here as well. So, um, Bernardo, I think it's it, interesting because you're coming at it from the perspective of a, a, an advertising agency, if you like, looking at it from that perspective. So what do you see as, as the, the, the big challenges of how brands can work with, with um, creative strategies and games in order to, to, to make all this uh, a positive contribution, a positive experience? Yeah, uh, when we launched Druid, like we we launched Druid because we 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 see some advertising in games and we think like that's cringe AF, right? <laughs> uh, we don't like some kind of advertising. I, I understand the developers that want to choose the brands that they connect through their gamers, because uh, some of them doesn't make any part of our ecosystem that kind of stuff. So uh, from a, a advertiser a perspective, what we try to do at Druid is like bring two pillars, immersion and um, live streaming. So mm -hmm. when we think about like immersion, we think about like tech cheaper right now and easier to code. So you uh, here like work at that game. Love. So they, they develop a lot of like cool in-game experience for a lot of different uh, advertises, he knows what I, I'm trying to, to say here, but it's not about building your own game. It's about being inside existing ones and think about like entertain your audience, give them a, a cool experience and don't break the, the final user experience. That's really important. And second mm -hmm. part that we try to, to, to do is like create some live streaming strategies because we know that live streaming right now is booming, right? Uh, it's it's um, uh, increasing ar around 10%, if I'm not wrong, since like five or six years ago, uh, year over year. So when I think about like in-game advertising, we think about like, how can we do an, adver uh, an advertising that don't break this uh, gaming experience for the final user, but at the same time, what we can do that is shareable that the, the, the final user will see the, the advert game, that the advertising inside the game and, and think about, hey, I will share that with my audience. I will share that with my colleagues. I will live stream this experience and, and bring some more attention for the game in the advertising industry. We, we think about that. That's really interesting. Um, John, let me, let me come back to you. Um, one of the things I think that that seems to come out of this, certainly from the from the report's point of view, is um, that there are clearly some differences country by country in terms of um, how people engage with games. Um, um, the report we've done, so Japan seems to be way up there in terms of the, the sheer number of of people really really doing some gaming every every single day. And at the other end of the scale, you get Brazil, where it seems to be a different sort of profile. What's your view on um, how you how you cope with those different sorts of national markets when you're when you're um, looking at ad advertising in games because you've got quite different audiences there. Do, does that translate into different reactions to advertising, or do you, it, does that play a, a, an influence at all? Well, there is no major change, well, at least on our side, uh, because we do um, develop some tailor-made strategies for uh, brands in each country. So basically, mm -hmm. we, will, we will pick, well, just to put a very simple example, if we do have some objective from a brand in terms of uh, impact frequency, uh, or even profile of user, we will pick um, a set of a, a number of games that will fit exactly the, um, the objective of the brand. So we will know that in certain market we will lack of, uh, if we have a very low frequency, then we might like some inventory because we know people are playing a bit less in, in yeah. one geo, but it's really about, um, about thinking about the market characteristics, the, the brand's objectives and making the best possible fit. So indeed, uh, oh, at least hopefully we we do have a bit, a bit higher engagement on our games in Brazil. So it's not that low. So we have higher frequency, mm. but it's 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 as well. A, I think a, a good a good point and, and a, a good KPI to keep in mind for the the developers, so they know that 
all the geos will not um, react the same way. If they have less interaction, if they have less engagement, then they know they might do some maybe localization about the games, uh, doing some special events, some special contents, so that people from one country that might be strategic for their advertising strategies. So I think within Latin, Latin America, it's uh, Brazil is uh, highly relevant, is a really strategic market. Then you might want to focus into engaging a bit more those users and having a kind of a local strategy to boost a little bit engagement when you go into monetizing a bit more those mm -hmm. uh, those geos mm. that's interesting um and bernardo did you have any view on that as well in terms of sort of how you see uh differences across different um geos and so on uh we mainly focus in latin america right now i don't have a full visibility for other Part of the globe i'm sorry but uh, speaking about uh latin america we we usually see uh, a lot of different uh on local culture and history around like influencers uh, that are the biggest ones and kind of games that they they want to play at that country so for example we see a lot of passion in brazil for league of legends that is mm -hmm. a cool title uh but you don't see that kind of passion uh, around all over Latin America because the League of Legends ecosystem is not that much developed. Mexico, yes, but the rest of Latin America, we see that users most like Dota 2, that is a directly competitor between the games. So we see that kind of difference. Uh, okay. it's, it's, yeah, it's because of like historic investments that like publishers make that kind of stuff. And we see a lot of different um, platforms being uh, played all over Latin America. So for example, for Mexico, if I'm not wrong, the, the most common platform is Xbox. And in Brazil right now, the most common platform is uh, PlayStation. So that makes a, a big difference uh, between the games that we choose on our strategies to use mm -hmm. for our clients. You know, because the PlayStation Xbox has a lot of exclusivity uh, deals all over the globe with some publishers and developers. That mm. kind of difference we see. But one common thing in Latin America right now is mobile game. So mobile game is booming so much. Free Fire uh, made a blast uh, launch in Brazil three years ago. I know that it's so big in Latin America as a whole. And now it's entering the United States. Mm -hmm. uh market that it, that will be like really cool to watch <laughs> what, what free fire will make on United states right now because uh um uh, uh, entry level cell phone can play free fire and it's not like that common for fortnite or some mm -hmm. other um high level games and uh, mobile games as uh, of Duty mobile that is it's really hard to play on entry level cell phones as well that, that's why Free Fire made a blast in Brazil, Mexico, all over Latin America. Let's see what makes on the United States. I answered your question? I think so. Absolutely. Um, I think it's interesting that you mentioned sort of um, this difference between um, those sort of gaming platforms, Xbox, uh, and so on, and the, the, the rise of playing on a mobile. Um, perhaps I can bring in Joanne on this point as well, that does this present uh, new challenges for monetizing uh, games and, and, and apps on, on a mobile compared to some of the other platforms. Do, is it different? What are, what are the big challenges that you see in there? Uh, I mean, mobile is the single biggest gaming platform there is. Uh, it's uh, uh, in 2021 predicted to have a $90 billion uh, revenue. Uh, in, uh, and that includes advertising, uh, as well as premium and subscription games. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think that's the interesting question and probably differs market to market um, uh, around uh, why it's different because uh, for non-mobile platforms, um, free to play uh, is maybe not, uh, I mean, mobile really has created free to play um, um, a, a, as a business model. 
Um, so um, th there are clearly uh, challenges and um, between the different or variances between the different platforms. Uh, and as everything um, goes to new buzzwords, looking at metaverse, AR, etc., um, then then um, the model that developers. Um, um, you know, hybrid monetization, so um, multiple uh, models, um, is 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 also a key trend uh, um, that 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 we're seeing. I think one of the biggest challenges um, um, for for mobile um, is, you know, obviously, mobile advertising has been around a long time, um, but it, it relies on the data on the data that is collected that is passed. Um, um, uh, for the advertiser to allow uh, better measurement, better targeting, um, etc., mm. um, and that's the challenge that mobile has um, um, in, uh, because of uh, changes uh, within the ecosystem. Obviously, GDPR um, mm. and um, you know, MEF has always been a, a big advocate for uh, for data privacy um, and, um, uh, and and giving users. Uh, consumers uh, greater control um, and, mm -hmm. and that's the ch challenges and changes that the ecosystem are actually now seeing um, mm. um, because um, uh, so, so in 2021 then Apple uh, changed um, its um, uh, privacy uh, practices um, so it's called the app tracking transparency uh, which basically means the uh, identifier um, that was used and, and added incremental value for developers mm. and advertisers um, um, is now opt-in uh, rather than default switched on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so these are the kind of challenges that um, that specific to mobile uh, developers um, um, that they face. Um, and as uh, I think it was Jean said, you know, the rise of hyper casual games where that's the only model. Um, so there's no premium content or no uh, in-app purchases. Um, then, then obviously that has the biggest impact there. That's thing. So um, maybe we can bring everybody back in uh, at this point as well. Um, so I think uh, with sort of the, the rise of the, the GDPR and that sort of asking not to track, maybe a question for all of you. So how, how much can we uh, think that's going to change the, the environment for uh, mobile gaming going forward? Is that something that, that we expect to see a, a bigger impact um, or uh, is it just going to be a little blip on the road? Um, let me start with, with Bernardo. Is, is, this, is it going to change this sort of move to privacy or uh, is it just something people are going to cope with and we move on? We just need to adapt. I don't think that that will impact that much. Of course, we have, we have to make a lot of changes on how, how can we create these strategies and which kind of data we collect. But I think that that will be not too problematic. We, we can deal with that. Like that, that's not a big deal. <laughs> and what I think, yeah. And what what I think is happening is that a lot of publishers is not collecting any data. I know that Epic Games is leading this way. Uh, this, uh, so Epic Games is not collecting any data from any player all over the world, none from from the games or through the websites. So mm -hmm. we can deal without any uh, collected data. I think that, that, that's okay, but we need to adapt uh, and we need to so, move fast. So presumably it's just, uh, it's just being agile and working how to, how to monetize um, in a different sort of way. John, what, what's your perspective yeah. on all of this um, as, as data changes and, and the rules change? Well, in that case, I'm, I totally agree. It's all about uh, adapting, finding solution, and uh, in that case, to get um, a decent targeting. I mean, regarding data, uh, as uh, a game um, a game developer and publisher, we are doing and working with data all the time. I mean, uh, thinking about engagement, thinking about retention, thinking about uh, user acquisition is all about data. So mobile mm. gaming per se is based on data. So now we do have indeed that challenge as we are, well, or uh, top players like uh, Apple are changing the game, which is somehow as well a, a normal way, a normal trend in the history because there is a, this massification of the use of uh, um, mobile phones and entertainment within mobile phones. So as people are growing as well in the usage of the mobile phone, they are getting more conscious about uh, the information they are dropping there and 
they want to be more in control about that. So it's good to see as well the main players um, thinking about the privacy and protecting their users. But uh, indeed, now I, I really believe it's only a way of adapting because we will always look for data. And if the players have a good um, experience and they trust the developer behind the game, they will be okay into sharing data under certain conditions. So mm -hmm. it's all about providing that safety and it's it goes both way. I mean, uh, in, in, in that case, Gameloft works as a game developer, game publisher, and as well, let's say, a creative agency for brands. And we do want to provide, let's say, that safety and transparency to our user first, but to brands as well, because we do want brands to be really safe when they invest with us and they know that what we will be delivering is basically relevant for the users and is accepted by the users. So it's only about, uh, about adapting, finding new ways of collecting the data and new ways of, uh, of using it, being transparent with the users. So it's almost like managing that buy-in and being transparent about that. So in the last couple of minutes, let me, let me um, put all three of you on the spot. What is going to be, do you think, um, the one biggest challenge to mobile gaming in particular over the next year or two? Um, let's go back to Bernardo to start with. The biggest challenge to the industry for mobile gaming. I think that the biggest uh, one is, is bringing this metaverse to the mobile experience as well. Because we're seeing a lot of uh, cool stuff happening on Fortnite, Roblox, and goes on. But with a uh, focus on, on platforms as PlayStation, Xbox, or PC experiences, we are not seeing that much happening on mobile. I know that mobile uh, break the rules for, for accessibility. So I think like it's the biggest like potential for the metaverse to exist is on a mobile phone in your pocket. But right now, the, the met, this kind of metaverse that we are discussing every day on the gaming ecosystem right now is not that accessible through smartphones yet. Good point. Joanne, over to you. Biggest challenge? Um, I think certainly in, in, in recent time, then user acquisition has become very expensive. Um, and obviously for big giant publishers like Gameloft, um, then, um, <laughs> uh, then um, uh, the ecosystem exists, um, but you know the indie developer uh, and being able to monetize games at scale. Um, so for 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 games that have um, hundred thousands of users rather than uh, billions of users of the examples that we've probably chatted about today, um, then that's a key challenge. And and I think um, new uh, hybrid monetization and um, Im immersive um, experiences uh, will, will, will certainly help um, uh, answer some of those uh, key issues. That's great. John, over to you. Same question. Yeah, Just to, well, to wrap us all up with uh, to your yeah, final but, comments. I think we're we're facing a pretty interesting uh, momentum into the into the industry. Well, I'll see um, a few topics that will be keep being big. Uh, one of them, I think, is to see what will be happening um, within the market. I mean, we've been there for 20 years. We've seen a lot of um, new players coming along the year. I think currently uh, and the uh, Going back a bit to what Joan was saying, user acquisition is pretty difficult to get, but uh, and to do, and really expensive. It comes as well because there are new players coming almost almost every day. When you think about the the gaming offers that you do have into the um, the Google Play Store or the the um, the Apple uh, App Store, then you have just hundreds of thousands of uh, of games uh, being published and being available. So for the user, it's basically being into a crowded universe where you don't even know where, what to download and what to play. So I think that's one thing. And the, um, the hyper casual uh, trend uh, that was that started a few years ago is still very big. It will be interesting to see how users react as well. What kind of gameplay will be the, um, the most relevant one for the, for the users. And I think uh, there is as well a very good and interesting point that is related to the different platforms. So for a mobile game developers, thinking about how you can 
turn into a real multi-platform uh, developer. So uh, we know that Epic is uh, playing an important uh, role right now, an important, um, an important uh, place with the, um, the low issues they have with the big players. So they want to basically break as well this, this balance and the, the strengths within the market. So it's, it's pretty exciting to see how we can, we can start working and uh, thinking, on, uh, thinking of joining and partnering with new players within the market and finding new ways to get, uh, to get the users. That's a fantastic point in which to, to finish up. So collaboration and cooperation um, is, is a nice <laughs> positive note to finish on. Let me thank my, my panelists, Joanne Lacey, Bernardo Mendez, Jean Salterin, uh, on, a, on a very interesting discussion. Um, and uh, there's obviously a lot more work to do, a lot of interesting developments that we're going to see coming over the next year or so. So uh, with that, thank you all very much. Um, and, and goodbye for now. Thanks Cheers, a guys. lot. Thanks. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye -bye.